Good evening. Goodbye Forever by Naktar Rinpoche. Chapter 3, Part 3. Yes, when pigs learn to fly, there was no way my father was ever going to change his mind about anything. My father was a huge fortress of law and rules, and everything was written down with the absolute agreement of God. There was no chance of anything changing about anything. The only freedom I had was in Wayflood Woods, where I hoped I would see the White Lady again. I'd sit in an old yew tree for hours, trying to be silent enough to see her, but she never came other than in dreams. There was another freedom, and that was Mr Love's garden. It was always pleasant, if slightly unkempt by conventional standards. The grass was always a little too long and there were no flower beds. There was just grass and trees and it felt much more natural there than in the brutally manicured gardens of other people in Woodsfield Lane. I liked the way that the grass round the base of the trees was longer than elsewhere. Mr Love told me that was because the lawnmower couldn't go right up to the trees. I told him I was glad of that because it looked much nicer with the small circle of long grass. Blue singer and landscape gardener, smiled Mr Love. I am glad you approve of the arrangement. I'm afraid I don't mow the lawn as often as I should, nor do I mow it short enough. It's perfect, just as it is, Mr Love. I like your garden best of all. I also liked the way that the Love's garden merged into the lane behind. There was no fence there. All the other gardens had fences at the back, but the wooden fence at the back of the Love's residence had long since collapsed and they'd used it as firewood. The lack of fence made the Love's garden appear much longer than the others and I liked the sense of distance it gave. It was always utterly delightful to sit in one of the Love's ancient deck chairs, listening to blues, and sipping the lovely ginger beer which was made by Mrs Love. Mrs Love was not Mr Love's wife, she was his sister. The social etiquette of the day made her Mrs Love, even though she was a spinster. It seemed that all unmarried women over a certain age became misses by default, unless they were school teachers, and then they were called miss even when they were married. The rules of the adult world were unbelievably complicated. The rules of music seemed so much simpler at least they could be understood. I must have been thinking about the inebriated bee, or at least the thought of the bee recurred intermittently. One night it recurred in a dream as a beautiful blue bee, a blue that was almost peacock blue but tinged with green. I described the colour of the bee to my mother who told me that this colour might be described as turquoise, but that she had never heard of bees being that colour. The words turquoise bee remained with me as some sort of symbol. It sounded like a name I could call myself, the Scarlet Pimpernel. Maybe I was the turquoise bee. There were words in the dream, but I could not remember them exactly as they had been. It seemed as though I had spoken those words. The flowers are all gone, but the turquoise bee isn't sad. I won't be sad either, even though Alice has gone away. That was a strange idea and strange words, but they stayed with me. One thing that was not at all easy to understand was that Mr Love had queer terms. 
It had something to do with World War II, but no one wished to elucidate beyond a certain point. The intelligence from my parents was that he was shell-shocked, but the loves never used that term. Mr Love himself told me that he had queer turns and that if I ever found him not being quite myself or talking strangely, then it would be better not to try to talk to him that day. What would that sound like, Mr Love? Oh, I don't know really, young Victor. I can never remember what I sound like when I'm having a queer turn, but it doesn't make much sense and you would not want to hear that kind of thing. Mrs Love, who just brought out a lovely large tumbler of ginger beer, said, I will let you know if it's not a good idea to come visiting, so there's no need to worry. And that was it. That was all I ever knew. I did see Mr Love once or twice on Wayflood Road when he was absorbed and talking to himself. I bade him good day and he'd shaken his head. I took it as a sign that I'd better say no more and that was it. My mother couldn't explain it to me but assured me that Mr Love was a good man and never meant any harm even when he was talking nonsense. Some people have been offended by him and they say he is rude to them. But he has never been rude to me in all the years we have lived in this house. My father thought he would be better off in an institution, but my mother disagreed entirely. She never directly contradicted my father on this subject, but she told me what she thought. I only found out later the grief I caused my mother by virtue of my blues education. She'd had to bear the brunt of my father's consternation. Mr Love was not a safe person to be in the company of a child, as far as he was concerned. The fact was, however, that no harm had come to me during a dozen visits, and there was always Mrs Love at hand should anything worrying occur. In the end, my father had no obvious argument against that apart from the fact that Blues was a depraved row. Life rolled on, and I learnt that I'd booked another ticket to ride on the Desolation Express. Alice had gone to some unknown location in Herefordshire, and soon Mr Love was to follow. Not to Herefordshire, but to a place equally as obscure. Again, someone I loved was to move beyond my reach. Mrs Love died without warning. There was no illness. She died in her sleep of nothing in particular. Her heart just stopped beating and suddenly she wasn't there. Mr Love was badly shaken by the death of his sister and his queer turns merged into something permanent. Before I could understand what was happening, it wasn't, and Mr Love was gone. The house was sold, and Mr Love had been taken to Brookwood, the mental hospital, where he died some time later. It was the most dreadful misery that Mr Love was dead, and that I would never see him again. It was at that time that the White Lady came again and she appeared every night for a while. When she was there, I came to feel that Mr Love had gone somewhere else and that it wasn't maybe as sad as I thought. I knew there wasn't any heaven where God lived or any nonsense of that sort, but it was good to know that death was not actually the ultimate end. I didn't quite understand why I felt less miserable, but somehow it seemed as if everything was understandable without actually being understood. The white lady, as before, never spoke, so there was nothing to understand. 
She simply looked at me, or through me, or into me. And I understood things that I called sky, or clouds, or clouds made of sky. These skies were ideas that hadn't appeared, but were always about to appear. They were like the experience of words on the tip of my tongue. They were the moment before ideas happened. In one of these skies, the idea appeared that the white lady was looking at Mr Love and that somehow he would always be in my life somewhere. The next day I translated this as Mr Love becoming an encouraging voice, albeit voiceless, who would always be there. I had the idea that he could become a baby again. He'd grow up in some happy place where he'd be able to hear blues again. But that was not something that came from the white lady. That was just my wishful thinking. At that time, I was aware of the light that emanated from the white lady and began to feel that it could help people if that light shone on them. It would help people because the light was the white lady. It didn't just come from her. It was then that I decided to picture Mr Love in my mind and see the light of the white lady shining on him and through him. It seemed obvious to me that this would help Mr Love, but how this idea came into being, I have no idea. Ideas like this would appear in my mind from time to time and I would have complete confidence in them. Mr Love had promised me he'd leave me his blues records when he died, but the records vanished with the house. It was apparently illegal for a child to go to a mental hospital, so I could not visit him. I don't think my father ever said that, but he may as well have done. It simply wasn't possible and I was a miscreant for even mentioning the possibility. The boy will probably end up in Brookwood himself if he doesn't learn some sense. Maybe I would. Maybe life would be better in Brookwood Mental Hospital. There'd be no laws about normality because it would be normal for everyone to be abnormal. Normal life seemed terrible to me and I wondered if you could go to other countries where there were no laws about normality. I remembered being in Germany one holiday when my father stayed at home. My uncles and aunts and older cousins asked me what we should all eat for dinner, and I'd said cheese on toast. Then, miracle of miracles, they made cheese on toast with tomatoes and onions, just as I'd said it should be. What a wonder. Maybe I should go and live in Germany because it wasn't as normal there. I remembered that the houses in Alften, where Tante Rickchen and Uncle Arnold lived, often had beautiful round paintings of animals on the outside wall. They were often paintings of stags, and I loved to look at them. These round paintings were obviously extremely abnormal because no one had pictures on their houses in England. They had really good bread there too and marvellous cakes. They had delicious sausage and cheese and real fruit juices made from blackberries and all kinds of berries. Yes, I'd have to go and live there. But then how would I find Alice again? That was life then. You loved people and they either died or went away. My grandmother, Clara Schubert, had died. I'd loved my grandmother. She was a fine old lady who knew a lot about music. She thought that black people were just as good as us, or better, and that people who thought otherwise were better placed in Brookwood than Mr Love. It was obvious that she was right about that. And I wondered why it was that most of the lunatics 
actually lived outside the mental hospitals. It was no use asking how to make sense of life because that wasn't a sensible question. My mother had far more sympathy with the question than my father, but she said that questions like this couldn't easily be answered till I was an adult. When would that be, I wondered? Maybe when I went to junior school in September? That was to be a boys' school rather than the mixed-sex infant school I'd attended up to that point. My father had decided that I shouldn't go to the mixed-sex junior school because my association with Alice had made me even more abnormal than I was before. The Trevelyans had been atheist naturist cranks and he suspected them of having communist sympathies. He wondered how they'd come by their money. They obviously had too much money for their own good because they were prodigal in spending it. They had two cars when only one was required. Why should Mr Trevelyan's wife need a car of her own? Housewives didn't need cars. He'd never been able to ascertain the nature of Mr Trevelyan's employment, but as he'd never met him, he'd been unable to inquire. My mother thought he might be an architect, as he had a room with a large table that could tilt, or something of that sort. My father was doubtful because architects were serious-minded people who were not prone to eccentric fads. My time playing with Alice at the Trevelyan's home had also led me into disagreeable dalliance with two other girls, Bethany and Gillian, and that had obviously wrought havoc with his character. My mother naturally thought this was overstating the case and she'd been glad that I'd had some friends of my own age locally. She said, in Germany, it is normal for little boys and girls to play as friends at this age. My father had harumphed at that. Maybe in Germany, Renata, but this is England. Here, boys learn to enjoy sport and to take interest in manly pursuits. Sadly, Bethany and Gillian had moved to Oxford six months after Alice had moved to Hereford. And as I'd only ever played with them at the Trevelyan's house, our contact was not the same. I did go to their house a few times, but their parents were not at all like the Trevelyans. They were kindly, but seemed in some way to be of the same point of view as my father. A boy was somehow not quite appropriate as a friend for their daughters. Hard on the heels of that piece of bad news, I would soon be moving up to the next school, which was West Street Boys School in Farnham. That was the next horror. I was to be subjected to the unremitting company of boys. There'd be sport. How loathsome. My father told me about the sport. You should be really pleased. I told him that I was really pleased but I don't think he believed me. The picture became worse with everything he said. He may as well have said, they'd strap a brace of rabid monitor lizards to my head and dunk me in liquefied dog dung every day. And tomorrow we'll start chapter four, Frigg and White Tara.